thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for sticking around to the late evening, or at least for us here in Germany, uh, to see this talk and the, and the next couple of ones as well. There's one more. Yeah, so this is going to be a little bit of an overlap with the previous two, um, but I want to just address a few things that maybe we can add to the party. Okay, so as we've seen in the previous talks, the, the task is to get probes onto the surface and uh, to get good electrical contact, which is not trivial in some cases. Um, at the same time, we need to minimize beam induced damage because as we saw the, the explosion voltage, the, the electron beam can uh, cause the devices to be changed or damaged. So we can't see what we're trying to see. And once the probes are on the surface, we want to be able to perform our fault analysis and isolation experiments. And so just touching on uh, acceleration voltage one more time, this is a comparison between a 1 kV image, which you just saw there, and then switching to 150 volts. And you can see the image just goes to mush. Uh, so that just gives you a really um, plastic uh, example of the, the challenge in, in getting uh, good imaging at low kV voltages. Uh, so another challenge we have is we have to bring our probe tips, which have some nanometers of tip radius, uh, from centimeters of distance down to nanometers close to each other, and that's seven orders of magnitude. And at this, as, we, as we just discussed, we have to do this um, at very low acceleration voltages. And uh, since moving the probes around at, at these low voltages causes the beam to distort and shift, the only solution is to do this with some form of automation. Um, beyond that, there's more challenges that we have to address. We need to be able to accurately uh, position the probes. That's uh, obvious. We need to be able to gently land them. We need uh, a clean environment. We need uh, have to worry about vibrations and noise. Drift, as we saw, is an issue. And uh, of course, operating at FIP angle is, is a plus because we can do things like circuit edits and also um, expose the, the context we want to address using delayering. Uh, and of course, most, of, most important of all, we need to get the samples in and out of the chamber as fast as possible so we get a nice process flow. Um, so the tool that I'd like to introduce for this is what we call a prober shuttle. Uh, the latest generation is uh, fully encoded. It has 27 piezo-driven axes with 0 0.05 nanometer step size. We specify a drift of less than one nanometer per minute. Uh, the platform's dimensions are such that it can fit through uh, many load lock systems. So you can introduce the whole platform, as well as the sample, the probe tips, everything into the microscope chamber via the load lock. You don't have to vent the main chamber. And this um, is, goes in the vein of keeping things clean. Uh, we use triaxes, of course, so we get very low noise levels, and we can operate at tilt angles. Oh, Here's um, some uh, two videos. I hope you can see them uh, fluidly uh, of the probe or shuttle being introduced into the uh, chambers. Um, on the left, we have a size system. On the right, we have a yeah, touching system. Awesome. But it can be any awesome. microscope in principle that has a sufficiently sized load lock. And on the stage, you can see here, there's a connector that allows one to, that allows the signals, the piezo drives, but also the measurement signals to be uh, transferred to the outside of the chamber. Um, so this, that, this is that connector mounted to the stage. In this case, it's a size microscope, but it, again, it could be any one. Uh, and then this is the uh, connector on the, on the stage, and this is the one underneath the probe shuttle. And when the shuttle is loaded into the, into, onto the stage, they, they meet and mate, and we get the signals fed through with these feed-throughs. Uh, and this is the vacuum side of things where we have a flange with uh, a feed-through for the piezo signals, but also individual tracks feed-throughs for all the uh, tip and, and sample signals. Um, so again, um, automated workflow, that's what we're trying to discuss. And um, we can see here, this whole sequence that we're gonna watch now is of course it's a time lapse, but it was done at hundred volts uh, acceleration voltage. And I'll talk about this in a second, but let's focus on the left side, which is the SCN image. And the first step is to restore the probes from their parked position into the working position um, or, or starting position. And this is a, a radius of approximately 40 microns. Um, this is followed by a manual step where we pre-align the probes um, at a radius of one micron and center them in the frame. Then comes another automated step where we uh, move the sample stage to within the probe's uh, vicinity. Uh, and then as we saw previously, the, um, the tips are landed on, this, on the substrate. In this case, we're looking at a seven nanometer device. Um, and you can see now the probes are being landed um, using also drag and drop inputs with the mouse. And uh, this is followed by uh, optimizing contacts. And um, the way we do this, see the next slide, is um, we, uh, we scan each tip 
uh, we do a permanent IV curve on each tip in a, if a given voltage range. In this case, it was minus one to one volts. And we scan each tip 10 times per second. And this gives a live real-time feedback. While the beam is, actual electron beam is frozen, we get live feedback on each tip's um, contact situation. And what we can tell from, this, from these graphs is that tips one and two, which are these two here, one, two, um, are not in contact with bulk or don't have a, don't have a conductive uh, connection to bulk. Tip three does have, have a diode connection as do tips six, seven, and eight. And uh, so we can use this information to, to adjust the probe's position very precisely is doing very minute steps without even looking at the image. The, the, the beam is still frozen and we can make sure that we have good solid contacts. And typically um, the, the gate contacts are not connected to bulk. So in order to um, ensure that the gate contact is also well-placed, we perform a similar measurement with uh, where we run transistor families. So we do 10 families per second and, um, and ensure that these families look clean and nice. So if we, if we were to raise one of the probes, then this would all go to noise. And if you land it down again, they come, the curves come back into view. Um, so that's how we ensure that the tips are in place and that we have good contact. And the next step is then to switch to a parameter analyzer of some sort. Um, the Keithley 4200 is not our product, but it's something that is very common in the billing analysis world. And uh, so we decided to incorporate it into our, our software interface so that we can drive it from without having to focus on another computer with another system and another interface. So you can uh, generate uh, measurement recipes here um, any way you like, uh, customize them and, and save them. And then you can um, load these recipes into batches and run them as sequences. So you place your probes and you walk away and then you come back and half an hour later and your measurements are done. And when you're greeted with an Excel sheet with uh, individual sheets for all the individual recipes, and these include uh, SEM imagery, as well as plots and the raw data, of course, for further analysis. We also recently included the Keysight B1500 system. That's another option that they all can look to operate in the same fashion. Um, I just touched on the acceleration voltage earlier, and I do want to share this image, which was taken at 80 volts. Um, but of course, we, we cheated here a little bit by using a very slow uh, or a very high dwell time, so a slow cycle time. And if you need one, uh, if you need 20 seconds to generate one SCM image, you're not going to be able to place probes because you need to be able to see them move. Um, but even at a dwell time of less than a second, we still have a discernible image that we can use to place the probes. And this is, of course, a quality of the microscope, which again can be any. So for our users, it's important that they choose a microscope that has this capability. And there are a few of them out there. Now we've also done images at, at much lower voltages. So. Um, so here's a, an image uh, hot off the press. This is from uh, last week. We finally got our hands on a five nanometer sample. Uh, it's hard to, to get these current and, and you know, cutting edge devices because the, our users are very you know, cagey about sharing images and information. So we have to wait until they become commercially available and then purchase one and process it and so on. But um, so we're very happy that we finally have a five nanometer uh, uh, device that we can actually show images. Um, so this is a simple transistor test. Um, now, going into more um, detailed failure location methods, I do want to touch on, on current imaging. And this is not a conductive AFM, but it's kind of similar. Um, what we do here is that we place a probe on a sample surface and, and just scan it over the surface. And there's no force feedback. And we can get away with this because our probes are so very stable and we know that the samples are very flat. This is a given in the, in the type of samples we're looking at today. So we can just place a probe and then gently scrub the surface. And using different bias voltages, we can see here that we get different results. Um, so we can use this to identify current flows where they maybe they shouldn't be there uh, or, or similar experiments. Uh, and now I'm gonna just touch briefly on EBIC and so on, which we saw in the, in the, on the previous presentations, but uh, this is a nice sequence of images showing the different results you get by varying the beams uh, acceleration voltage, so you, get, you change the penetration depth into the sample and then illuminate different or more and more of the well structure here in this case. And again, uh, from last week, this nice image uh, where we can actually differentiate the individual fins on a fin set device that we, that we obtained. Uh, then we saw EBIC and RCI, so I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, you can find opens and shorts. We, we've heard about this, and it's a very useful technique and used quite a lot in failure analysis. Uh, we also heard about eBirch, and of course, um, it's something that we also do. Um, by the way, I should mention all of these methods, eBIC, eBAC, eBirch, 
are done with our own amplifier that we supply uh, in conjunction with the system. Um, and here also, just as we previously saw, there's this transistor was stressed. We're driving a current from the source to the drain. And there's a hot spot here. That's where probably where the stress caused a failure to uh, precipitate. And we can characterize this failure and, uh, and, and of course, locate it where it is in the sample by over superimposing the two images. Uh, and lastly, for this section, um, we have electron beam reduced voltage imaging, which is one of the most recent additions to our toolkit. And this is a method that allows uh, visualizing and, and locating very, very minute changes in resistance. Uh, so it's good for really for, for finding soft failures. Uh, I did mention earlier that probing at fib tilt is the plus. Um, these are two fibs that we've done this with. On the left, we have a cross beam from Thais, and the right is a test can with Zaya, I believe. Um, and so there are, there are many different uh, applications for, for using a, a probing system inside of the FIB at FIB tilt. Um, we saw uh, like this kind of workflow for locating a failure that was described earlier, but also maybe you want to do a circuit edit where you, ha you have a device that's failing and you, you have, have one minute left. Thank you. We have designer, your designer has said, okay, I can, um, maybe if we cut this line and add a resistor here, we can, we can fix this device. And before you put that into production, you want to test it out. So you can make these edits and then confirm that the edits were successful in situ. And uh, lastly, delayering. Um, so we have users that like to delayer the sample using PFIB. So we move the sample away from the probes to minimize contamination, do the delayering, and then move the probe back, the sample back to where the probes are to do EBAC. And then you can alternate between these two modes and then quickly locate the failure by uh, further and further digging into the sample to, to reveal this uh, failure location. And finally, um, we think that we're ready for the future because we have high stability and we can, this image shows three probes placed on a seven nanometer contact and they stay there for long times. And we can, uh, so we don't have, we don't have smaller samples, but we're not ready for three nanometer, we don't have a three nanometer sample yet, but we're ready for it because we have this high stability. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. All right, uh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We are perfect in time. Uh, so another Q&A session. So Matthew, please take over. Okay. So I'm waiting for questions. So Thomas Angel, if you have another question, please, please chime in now. Um, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> while I'm waiting, um, I will ask a question because you know, you showed the probing on the five nanometer structure. Yes. So obviously we're doing on contacts. Um, here and not actually at the five nanometers. What are the the probe uh, radius curvature that you that you need to do this type of probing? So the probes that we use um, for this image here were have a radii of five nanometers. Um, but we the, the supplier of these probe tips um, they are going to give us some three nanometer and one nanometer probe tips to try out in the next couple of days. We're really we're eagerly awaiting uh, these to, to try them out and see how they work. Okay, and these are full metal tips, or what these are it? tungsten probe tips? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, now, I was another thing I was curious about. Uh, it was interesting to see that you sort of implemented a scanning feature uh, into your probes, so you could do uh, current imaging like we do in AFM. Yeah. Um, what, what is the sensitivity you have on that? What kind of current range can you measure? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I have been asked that in recent times. Um, but it, the, the hardware is um, similar to that of the EPIC amplifier. And it's, it's, so it's very sensitive. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to say it's going to be in the femtoamp range. Okay. But I have to get back to you to get a precise number. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, this, has, this presentation has lots of overlap with the previous two. So I, I'm not disappointed that there aren't that many questions. <laughs>